All right, welcome everyone to Tuesday Night Talks. I think everyone is a regular, so you know that Tuesday Night Talks is one way that the Science Center engages the community and shares research that's happening at the Science Center uh, around the sound and around the state. Um, we have the privilege of learning from Sabrina Garcia, marine biologist, aka shark nerd, um, who's going to teach us all about the salmon shark. Or, yep, yeah, salmon shark. Um, and if you have not already signed in on your way out, if you could please sign in, that helps us keep track of how many people are coming to Tuesday Night Talks, and it helps us understand what topics are really popular and what the community might want to learn more about. And I'm going to mute us and turn it over to Sabrina. Don't forget to write the weather on your thing. <laughs> All right, can you hear me okay? Hopefully yeah, you yeah. can't. Okay. Wonderful. And I know that there was a little bit of a delay when I was um, forwarding my slide. So um, if at any point I need to speak a little bit slower, uh, just uh, feel free to chime in and let me know. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight to this Tuesday night talk, especially on a sunny day. It looked like a sunny day over in Cordova. And I know those um, have been few and far between this this summer, especially in Anchorage. Uh, so thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Sabrina Garcia, and I am a marine biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And tonight I'm going to be chatting with you all about a collaborative salmon shark tagging program we have here in Alaska and what it's taught us about salmon sharks. And I'm going to be focusing on salmon sharks that make their home in the Bering Sea. But before diving into the tagging work, it helps to get to know the salmon shark a little bit better. The salmon shark is a widely distributed predator found in the coastal and oceanic waters of the North Pacific Ocean. Um, if you see the map on the bottom right, all those areas in red are areas where the salmon shark is present. So it ranges from Japan to the, ba to the Bering Sea, and then south to Baja, California, and just about everywhere in between. Salmon sharks reach a maximum age of about 25 years old and are typically between six and seven feet in length, though they have been reported to get up to 10 feet. So you may have heard references to the salmon shark being called the smaller cousin of the great white shark. And that's because salmon sharks, great white sharks, mako sharks, and poor beagle sharks are all part of the same family, the lamnidae. And one of the unique features of this family of sharks is that they're endothermic. And that means that they can keep their body temperature higher than that of the surrounding water. And of all the lamnid sharks, the salmon shark is the one that's able to keep its body temperature elevated much higher than the surrounding water compared to the other lamnid sharks. And, and it's for this reason that we tend to see salmon sharks much farther north than either great whites or mako sharks. And the map that you are seeing on the left, what it's showing is uh, satellite tracking data of salmon sharks in blue, great white sharks in black, and mako sharks in red. And you can see that while there is some overlap amongst the three species, the salmon sharks, which are those in blue, are found much farther north into Alaskan waters. Now that, that graph that's on the bottom of the map, what that graph is showing is the proportion of time they collected all this satellite tag data and that tag data was also collecting temperature data and what they calculated was the proportion of time spent at different temperatures and again the salmon shark data is shown in blue the great white great white shark data in black and the mako shark data in red and you can see that the blue representing the salmon shark is showing that these sharks spent um, all of their time between about 0 and 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 32 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but they, there's peaks at about 5 degrees Celsius and again at about, uh, about 11 degrees Celsius. And so they're spending mo mo most of their time in waters much colder than, than white sharks and mako sharks, though, though there is some overlap. So shifting gears to chat a little bit about what salmon sharks eat, uh, as their name suggests, salmon sharks do eat salmon, but are considered opportunist. 
Uh, and if you were to look at some of the Russian literature, the common name sometimes used for salmon sharks is actually herring shark. And that's probably due to the fact that, you know, salmon sharks on in the in Russian waters are probably feeding on herring aggregations. And so their common name is is herring shark, whereas our common name is salmon shark. And based on stomach content analysis, so when, when we looked at what was actually inside salmon shark stomachs, what we found is that they have a pretty varied diet and they appear to eat whatever is available. And so I put on this slide just some of the things that they found in salmon shark stomachs. Uh, so those are spiny dogfish. I'm going to go on the from top left and in, in a in, and go clockwise. So spiny dogfish, sablefish, squid, herring, lancet fish, pollock, and salmon. Um, but there's also other species that they found in salmon shark stomachs, like rockfish and dagger tooth and aca mackerel, and even some other species of fish like soury, but also crab and shrimp. And, and what we think is that diets probably vary across time and space. So in general, salmon are their primary prey in spring and summer, but we tend to see their diets shift primarily to squid and other fish species in other parts of the year. Um, but much about what we know about salmon shark diet is based on you know, actually pulling out their stomachs and seeing what's in there, but that only gives us information. It's kind of a snapshot. It just provides information of what that shark was eating in one place and in one time. And so here's an example we have of two studies that looked at the salmon shark um, at their stomach contents. And so we're first going to look at um, stomach contents from sharks that were caught in the western North Pacific, so shown by that yellow box on the map. And the shark stomachs analyzed from this study were mainly from younger sub-adult sharks taken in the springtime, so in April and May. And across the stomachs they analyzed, 96% of what was in their stomachs was squid. And then if we moved east, you guys might recognize this place, um, we, they analyzed some shark stomachs from Prince William Sound. Um, and all of, these, all of the sharks that they took the stomachs from were large females. And they analyzed those stomachs um, from July and August. So now we're, we're in midsummer. And from these stomachs, Pacific salmon, specifically pink, chum, and coho, um, made, out, made up about three quarters of their stomach contents. Um, and then they also found some other fish species in, in gray and then squid in blue. Um, and some of the fish species that they found from those stomachs were sablefish, rockfish, herring, uh, dogfish, flounder, and cod. And one of the things that I like to point out is that, you know, in summertime and in the sound, when, you know, when salmon are concentrated and they are abundant, we see that other species of fish and squid make up about a quarter of their stomach contents. And we don't really know, you know, these are just two studies, um, but we don't really know why do we see such different proportions of prey in these two studies. And, the, you know, it could be an issue of timing where, you know, in the Western study, we these stomachs were analyzed in, in spring and the Prince William Sound stomachs were analyzed in summer. It could be a location thing between the Western and Eastern North Pacific, or it could be a size thing where, you know, that one, the Western study was mostly looking at sub-adult sharks, whereas the study in Prince William Sound was was focused on large females. Um, but it's worth mentioning that we don't really have much information about what these sharks are eating outside of these four months. And when we usually think about sharks, we think about them being in, at the top of the food chain, and sometimes they are. Um, but here in Alaska, salmon sharks are not the top of the food chain. Uh, we have what are known as the offshore orcas, and these, these killer whales specialize in feeding on sharks. And in that top photo, you can hopefully see uh, an orca, and it's got a salmon shark in its mouth. And these orcas, because they're specializing on sharks um, and shark skin, they have th of these very special type of scales called dermal denticles, which are basically tiny teeth. And it, if you've ever touched a shark, it feels kind of like sandpaper. And so I, I really, this photo is really telling because this is an older, um, an older offshore orca, and you can see that their teeth have been almost ground down to the gums from feeding on on these sharks, um, which had eventually wore wore their teeth down. 
And that photo on the right um, is one that I just received earlier this summer. Um, somebody was at the Kodiak Harbor and snapped a photo of a stellar sea lion taking a bite out of a salmon shark. Uh, now, now, what I don't know is if the shark was alive and well and was taken down by the sea lion or if it was already dead or on its way on its way to death and was being scavenged but this was a pretty interesting observation i had never um seen or heard of a stellar sea lion uh munching on on a salmon shark so salmon sharks mature at uh, for males they mature between ages three and five and females mature a little bit later uh, between six and ten years old and we think that females give birth every other year to about four to five, pu four to five pups, um, and their gestation is, is nine months. But salmon sharks have this very unique mode of, of, uh, of reproduction, and, and it's called oophagy. And what that means is that the salmon shark female will, um, she'll release unfertilized eggs um, in her uterus and the tiny salmon shark pups, once they go through their egg yolk, which you can see um, in those in the top photo and in the bottom photo there, once they go through their egg yolk, um, they'll start eating those unfertilized eggs that the mom is is releasing. So by the time that these sharks come, you know, are born, they're born alive and they're fully developed, just tiny versions of of the adult. Um, so this is a, a pretty unique thing to salmon sharks. Uh, and what we really don't know is we don't know where male and female salmon sharks meet up um, to mate. So this is still something that, that's left to discover about this species. And this photo I just wanted to show, this was a uh, pregnant female salmon shark that was caught um, in the Northern Bering Sea. And she was pregnant. And when we saw her fins, I, I hope that you can see that there's a bunch of small um, puncture wounds on her fin um, and what we think th we think that those are mating scars um, while she was uh, mating with a male so it, uh, mating in sharks can be a little violent so when we saw those those marks uh, we wanted to see you know if she was pregnant and this was you know kind of gave us a clue that she might she might be so this was an interesting observation for for the Bering Sea to have a pregnant female shark caught up there so it gives us a, a clue that you know the Bering Sea might be um, either a place where mating is is occurring or where pregnant female sharks uh, may be inhabiting so I often get the question why should we care about salmon sharks uh, we have very limited information on the population abundance um, of these sharks and these trends. So we don't really know how many there are, uh, but we do know that salmon sharks are caught as bycatch in fisheries in the Bering Sea. And they're also targeted um, in sport fisheries in both South Central and Southeastern Alaska. And without this information, we don't really know the status of their population. Are they increasing, are they decreasing, or is their population pretty stable? We also know that they, they are a predator, um, and so they're an important part of the ecosystem, and they regulate species in lower trophic levels, which means that they maintain balance in the ecosystem. Um, and as a predator, understanding where they go and how often they overlap with species of commercial and subsistence um, importance might help us understand their effect, if any, on these populations of interest. And finally, we need to have a baseline of where these sharks are found to be able to determine what a changing climate might do to their populations down the line. Uh, last summer, I got reports of salmon sharks in Shishmaref and Point Hope, which is uh, north of the Bering Strait. Um, and it's really hard for me to know, are these rare drifters that made their way north, much farther north than, um, than we typically see them? Or do these sharks regularly make their way that far north and in this day and age, we just have a better way of communicating that information. Um, so in the future, we may wanna look back to now and, and understand what was normal. So much about, much about what we know about salmon sharks comes from their interaction with fisheries and from research surveys. Uh, but these only provide us with information from a specific time and place. And tagging sharks is a research method that we use to learn about a shark's ecology 
and the tag is the tool that collects the data, which then allows us uh, to answer our research question. So I wanted to talk to you about two of the type of tags that we typically use on, on sharks. Um, the first one are what are what we call PSATs, and what these are are pop-off satellite archival tags. And what these tags do is they are um, programmed to collect data for a certain amount of time by the user. And these tags typically, typically collect data like depth, temperature, and light level. And once that pre-programmed date um, is reached, that tag will pop off the shark, float to the surface, and it transmit all the data that it's collected to overhead satellites. Um, and then I can go in and, and, and download that data to my computer. Uh, the nice thing about these tags is that you can get a lot of highly detailed data and you never have to recapture that shark again. And as you can see in the photo, these tags are either um, attached to the dorsal fin, like you see in, in the photo here, um, or they can also be anchored into the, into the shark's muscle. Another pretty common tag um, that we use on sharks are satellite transmitting tags. And what these tags do is they send data every time the shark is at the surface. Uh, so you can see uh, one of those satellite transmitting tags on a tiger shark on the photo of, on the left. Um, the important thing to note about these tags is you can't just use them on any shark. You have to use them on sharks that are frequent visitors to the surface, otherwise you're not going to get data. So um, we couldn't really use this on a, on a deep water species, but we can definitely use them on something like a salmon shark or a tiger shark. And these tags uh, can last for a few years, which means we get a lot, of, a lot of data and we can use data from multiple years to look at trends over time. And you can also program, you know, if you have a little more money, you can also, you know, buy these tags that collect depth and temperature data in addition to the location data. Um, but again, there's a trade-off with, you know, what, what's the research question, what's the data you need, and how much funding do you have? Um, and these tags are always attached to the dorsal fin with the antenna pointing up so that when that tag notices that it's, it's dry, it has a little sensor that once it's it's dry, it sends the location. So I wanted to chat a little bit about salmon shark migration and what we think we know about salmon shark migration in the North Pacific. So salmon sharks in the Western North Pacific are believed to migrate north in the spring and summer, and then go south to Japan in the fall to overwinter. And these assumptions are based on incidental catches of salmon sharks in research surveys from Russian and Japanese fleets between the 1960s and 1980s. Um, salmon sharks in the Western North Pacific have not been satellite tagged or tracked. Salmon sharks in the Eastern North Pacific have a similar migration with sharks present in coastal Alaska in the summer. And they typically begin southward migrations in the fall. Um, but there are some individuals that end up staying in the Gulf of Alaska year round. Um, no sharks have been satellite tagged crossing uh, the North Pacific, so it's unknown um, if mixing occurs between these two presumed Western and Eastern groups of salmon sharks. Now, salmon sharks in the Eastern North Pacific have been extensively tagged in, in Prince William Sound. Uh, these tagged sharks were all unique in that they were um, predominantly females. Uh, and this is because salmon sharks, like many other species of sharks, they separate in both space and in time by sex. And these female salmon sharks covered a lot of ground um, in, the in the North Pacific, as you can see on this figure. So each of those dots is a daily location uh, from a tagged female shark that was tagged um, as part of that large study in the sound. And you can see that none of these, um, these are about 65 sharks, you can see that none of these sharks crossed the dateline, um, or, you know, not many even crossed the Aleutians into the Bering Sea. So when we catch sharks during our surveys, this is typically what they look like when they come onto the deck. Um, I know the video might be a little slower, but uh, just pretend that it's not that slow and it's really fast because that's what it's like when, when we get them on the deck. Uh, they're very energetic and they're basically a, a few hundred pounds of muscle. So we have to work quickly um, and carefully to get these sharks tagged. Um, 
the shark in this video is being tagged with a spaghetti tag and that tag it just has a small unique number on it with a telephone number so that if anyone were to recapture this shark they could call the researcher and report where that shark was captured um, spaghetti tags are great because they're very inexpensive but they require the shark to be recaptured for you to get information on uh, where it was uh, where it was initially tagged and where it was eventually captured but you don't really know um, what happens to that shark in between and that's really where the satellite tags um, you know are based the, the best for for getting that kind of information so how do we tag sharks uh, the first thing we want to do once we get that shark on deck um, is we want to insert a hose in the mouth and what that does uh, is it keeps water flowing over their gills so salmon sharks uh, you know they, when you see them they're swimming with their mouth open what that does is that forces water over into their mouth over their gills and so that's what we're trying to emulate with the hose in the mouth um, we also cover their eyes with towels to to reduce stress um, it also helps us because once that towel goes on it usually calms the shark down enough uh, so that we can get the tag in and then um, and get that shark back in the water as quickly as possible so what can we learn from tagging sharks um, from satellite tag data, we can learn about migration patterns and find out, um, do these migration patterns change across seasons? What are their habitat preferences? Um, you know, where do they move across the ocean, but also in the water column? Do they prefer certain temperatures or certain depths? Uh, do they return to the same places over and over again? Um, are there areas where we see that these sharks have the potential to interact with fisheries? And, and finally, when we tag sharks, we use that opportunity to collect additional information like length, sex, and we also collect a little piece of their fin for uh, genetic sampling. So this um, salmon shark tagging project, it's a collaborative effort. So um, while I'm the one speaking to you here today, there's folks at UAF and NOAA, um, also across the Pacific in both Canada and Russia that are a part of this, of this collaborative effort. Um, and what we do is we opportunistically tag sharks during salmon surveys, uh, primarily in the Bering Sea, but also in the Gulf of Alaska and North Pacific. And when we started this program in 2017, we had very few tags and really we, we just focused our efforts on tagging sharks um, in the northern Bering Sea. And that map on the right is showing all the salmon shark captures during salmon surveys in the Bering Sea uh, with females shown in pink, males shown in purple and uh, sharks that weren't assessed for sex in gray. And what I hope really pops out to you is that most of the sharks that we encounter in the Bering Sea are males. And if you recall, the previous salmon shark tagging efforts in the sound um, only tagged female sharks. So the Bering Sea provides us this really unique opportunity to learn more about this part of the population. And over time, as our program developed and we got more collaborators, we, we did expand our tagging efforts. So not, we're not only focusing on surveys in the Bering Sea, but also um, on other surveys that have a probability, a good probability of encountering salmon sharks. So, oop, there we go. <laughs> so to date, we have tagged nine sharks and I'm showing the uh, tagging locations of all of those sharks and the sex of those sharks. So we've tagged seven males and two females. Um, six of those sharks were in the Bering Sea. Um, and now while nine sharks doesn't sound like much, this the information that we've gotten from these tagged sharks has given us some new information on salmon shark migration. So what we hope to learn from these tag data are where do salmon sharks go throughout the year? Do they visit the same sites year to year? Do they always come back to the Bering Sea? What factors affect migrations? And are the sharks from the Bering Sea separate populations? So starting off on the left was the first male salmon shark that we tagged in 2017. Um, the little pink star shows where he was tagged just west of Nunavak Island. And each of these dots on the map represent um, a day of the year and they're color coded by month. So this shark traveled south out of the Bering Sea after he was tagged in September. Um, and he went straight and spent the uh, winter off the coast of Southern California. 
Um, however, in June, the shark began to swim straight back to the Bering Sea where he arrived uh, in August. And interestingly, the shark's migration matches what we what we know of female shark migration um, from those that were tagged in the sound, um, except that he chose to spend his summer back in the Bering Sea instead of uh, in Prince William Sound. And then with one of the sharks that we tagged last summer, we saw a similar migration. This 2022 male was tagged in the Southern Bering Sea, and he also left the Bering Sea to overwinter off the coast of California. Um, and this shark, since he was tagged last year, he's still transmitting. Um, and this, uh, the last locations I got were from two days ago. Um, and so he's back where he, pretty close to where he was originally tagged. So he's back in the Bering Sea, almost to the exact place where he was tagged uh, just over a year ago. And I hope that these videos show for you guys. These are two animations from a male shark that we tagged in 2019. And again, each of these dots represent a daily location that are color coded by month. And the animation on the left shows his path in year one, and the one on the right is showing his path in year two. And so in year one, he, sp he, he spent most of the year throughout the North Pacific, but then he started to make his way back to the Ber Bering Sea in June, where he arrived in July. Um, in year two, we see a different migration pattern where he'd made multiple return trips uh, between that region and the maroon box and the Bering Sea. And although you can't see the bathymetry on these maps, I've highlighted that area with the maroon box because that's an area of underwater seamounts. Um, and it's interesting to see that in both of those years, um, between October and December, he did return to that, to the area within, uh, close to the seamount. Um, and again, in the second year, we do see that he came back to the Bering Sea. And, and I wanted to show these plots side by side so that you can see that even within an individual salmon shark, migration patterns do vary across years. Um, these are, and this is another track from a shark that was tagged last winter. This was tagged by one of our Russian collaborators during um, a multinational expedition to study salmon in the winter. Uh, this, sam this salmon shark was a male and he was tagged south of the Aleutians. Uh, his tagging location is shown by that yellow star. Um, and this shark also used a lot of the, you know, the pelagic waters of the North Pacific, like we saw in the previous slide. Um, but then he spent his the month of April just off the west coast of the U.S. Um, in this map, you can actually see that underwater chain, the underwater seamount chain that I referred to in the previous slide, and it's again outlined in that maroon box. So just wanted to show that this shark also visited that area in the same months, general months that the, the shark that I showed on the previous slide did. Um, seamounts are supposed to have strong currents around them that congregate fish. So this might be a good area for, for food for these sharks. Um, that maybe is uh, consistent in, in, in winter and fall when they're visiting this area. This is, uh, the, this is the last track I have for you, and it's from a large female that we caught last summer. Uh, this is the largest shark that we tagged to date. She was just over eight feet. Uh, and we tagged her uh, just south of Nome, shown by that pink star. Um, and so this was the first female that was tagged in the Bering Sea. So um, most of the sharks that we tagged in, that were tagged in Prince William Sound were all females. So it's really exciting to see what a female that was spending its summer in the Bering Sea, um, what's its migration track look like and how does it compare to those female salmon sharks that were tagged um, in Prince William Sound. And so you can see from this map that um, she didn't spend her winter off the coast of California. She um, actually spent most of her time just north of, of Hawaii. And in that study, in that previous study, they did get a shark that also spent um, some time just north of the Hawaiian island, islands. And I've outlined those tracks in purple. Um, it's interesting to see that this female that was tagged in the Bering Sea also returned to the Bering Sea for the summer. And so we're seeing that, you know, males and females that are spending their summers in the Bering Sea are returning to that, to that region. And there are, you know, co concentrations of salmon and herring in the Bering Sea and Pollock as well. So the Bering Sea might be an important place for these salmon sharks. So from these tagged sharks, we've seen that um, salmon sharks tagged in the northern Bering Sea um, 
even though they um, access much of the North Pacific and go down to California, we didn't see any of these sharks um, go into Russian waters or south um, or south to Japan. Um, it seems like there are some sites like the region around that seamount chain and the Bering Sea that those sharks are reliably visiting at certain times of the year. Uh, we did see that the sharks tagged in the Bering Sea all returned to the Bering Sea the following summer. The migrations between the male and female sharks tagged in the Bering Sea were a bit different, but we also saw that um, sh male sharks tagged in the Bering Sea had different migrations as well. We saw some male sharks tagged in the Bering Sea overwinter in California, um, but we saw some males that overwintered in, in the pelagic waters of the North Pacific. So um, while we did see distinct migration patterns across male sharks and female sharks, um, knowing why um, what might be affecting those migrations is a little bit harder to answer. So we need to get some more tags. Um, and since the sharks in the Bering Sea traveled far and wide, it's really hard to say anything uh, concrete about population structure with, with uh, the data from so few sharks. Um, it is interesting to note that none of our sharks spent any time in the Western North Pacific, um, you know, primarily in Japanese and Russian waters, but we do know that there are salmon sharks over there. And so what are the challenges with this research? So I told you at the start that we had tagged nine sharks, but I only showed data um, from five of the sharks. So what happened to the other sharks? Uh, while satellite tagging technology is incredible and it continues to get better and better every year, it's not perfect. Uh, this shark that I'm showing was tagged in 2021 and it was tagged uh, with both that satellite transmitting tag in purple. Um, that's the one that sends the locations. But it was also tagged with the uh, with the pop off satellite archival tag shown in in yellow. So it was carrying two tags. And the map on the left shows that we were receiving daily locations from that shark. Um, but in December, we we didn't get after December 4th, we stopped receiving any locations. Um, salmon sharks can stay below the surface for, you know, a month at a time. But it was very unlikely that they would be staying down for um, periods of, of multiple months. So based on the lack of location data, I thought that something, either the tag had malfunctioned or maybe the shark had perished. Um, but luckily we had the archival tag on the shark and those archival tags are set to record data for a year. And so what you're seeing in the bottom of this slide is the actual data from the archival tag. And that yellow arrow is marking um, when we stopped receiving location data from uh, the, from the transmitting tag in December. And what you can hopefully see from this figure is that after that time, that shark was still moving up and down the water column. So what this is showing, zero represents the surface and then the depth, um, it, the water gets deeper as you move down. So after that tag stopped, stopped sending locations, that shark was still moving between about the surface and 300 meters. So that leads me to believe that the shark was alive and well and something just happened, to either the antenna broke or the tag malfunctioned. Um, one of the things that is still a mystery is that at the end of the t at the end of the tag life, you can see that um, the tag records a depth of about 1,500 meters. And I don't know what would cause a shark to swim that deep, but these tags are programmed to pop off at 1,500 meters because um, any deeper will destroy the tag. So it's a way to save the data that has been recorded on the, on the tag. So um, that's why this tag popped off the shark. It was uh, just shy of the one year mark. Um, and it's because the, the shark went down pretty deep. And unfortunately, two of our other sharks had similar fates. So um, I just stopped receiving location data. So I presume that something happened um, to the tag or the antenna. And this just highlights the importance of getting out as many tags as we can because we never know which ones will last. Um, on the other side of, you know, of losing data, we did have one shark that has been transmitting for four years, um, even though these tags are marketed as, as lasting for three years max. So that's pretty exciting. So our future research efforts, we hope to continue to opportunistically deploy tags on vessels sampling in the Bering Sea in the North Pacific. Um, we have distributed tags to colleagues in Russia so that we can um, get some of these tags on those sharks in the Western Bering Sea and see 
are those sharks on, on on the other side of the Bering Sea? Do they go down as Japan and are they doing different migrations and could they possibly be a distinct population? Um, unfortunately, I, I sent those tags about two months before the war in Ukraine. So they're currently sitting in my colleague's office and I'm hoping that they will get deployed um, sometime in the near future. Um, and then the other thing that we're working on is we're working on getting um, the tissue samples from my collaborator in Canada with the tissue samples from my collaborator in Russia to see if we can genetically distinguish the sharks from the Eastern and North Pacific and try to figure out genetically if these two, if these two groups are actually uh, distinct populations. And finally, I just wanted to put a call out there that if you do see a salmon shark, and um, I, I know they're in the sound, so if you do see salmon sharks, I'd love to hear about it. Um, you can report sightings directly to me. My phone number is on the flyer. Um, we also have a Facebook page. Um, if you snap a photo of that QR code, it'll take you straight to our Facebook page and you can send me sightings through Messenger. Um, and we also post um, updates on our sharks through that Facebook page. Um, and if there's any teachers out there that want to um, team up and, and you know work have their students work up some of the shark data, I'd be happy to collaborate. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And turn on the microphone. All right, go ahead, Marianne. So Sabrina, how do you catch them? Is it hook and line or, or what? Actually, the, hopefully you can see that video that's playing since we're catching them during trawls, we're catching them during salmon survey. So they're being caught um, usually in surface trawls. Our, our surveys are for juvenile salmon. So the sharks typically get um, get caught in the trawl. They We assume that they swim with the trawl until we start hauling it back in. Um, and then once we get the trawl on the net and we see there's a shark, we, we're in quick tag mode to get the shark tag and released as quickly as possible. So these are not, they're not directed um, shark tagging. This is all opportunistic on, we're just leveraging existing survey platforms. Yeah, Pete? Uh, Sabrina, yeah, great, great talk, very interesting. Um, I, I know the Russians look at, uh, they do trawl surveys and they collect salmon they look at wounds on, on salmon and they're able to identify what predators created those wounds. And I'm wondering if that's something you're doing or or what, yeah, whether you can tell if a salmon has been attacked by a salmon shark just based on the tooth patterns. That's a great question. Um, on our surveys, we when we see a salmon with wounds, we usually record it. And most of the predators are pretty distinguishable, but most of what we see in the Bering Sea are um, lamprey um, and dagger tooth wounds. Um, with salmon sharks, there's not been a ton of documentation of salmon shark predation. So what they think is that when a salmon shark decides to predate a salmon, it usually ends in salmon mortality, which is why we're not seeing evidence of wounds. Um, you know, I see uh, sea lion bite marks on salmon, so not all of their predation attempts are successful. So what what we think is that if a salmon shark is going to go after a salmon, they usually get it because we're not really seeing um, salmon shark wounds on, on the salmon that we catch. So on the females in Prince William Sound, they still haven't figured out then where they're meeting up with the males? No, we still don't know. I mean, having the the data from the males to the tagged males from the Bering Sea that show that they overwintered um, in similar areas as the females that were tagged in Prince William Sound could be um, a potential mating area. Um, they, they've done um, analyses on the female ovaries and they think that mating happens in the fall so the timing doesn't really work out too well since they're mostly spending like winters and spring down down in the um off the west coast so we don't really know where they meet up and and we think that they give birth um off the coast of california oregon washington and that's only based on um the fact that a lot of juvenile salmon sharks strand along the west coast 
Um, so they just presume that the females are giving birth somewhere around there, but we don't actually know um, where they go to give birth. So still a mystery. Okay. How long have you been doing this research? I saw the one shark was taken in 2017, and, and then how expensive are those tags? Yeah, we yeah, 2017 was the the first um, shark that we tagged, and that tag was provided by uh, one of my collaborators was tagging uh, salmon and had a tag that he um, was able to refurbish and let me have. So it was like we had no money to do this work. Um, and, you know, gradually the interest has gotten a bit more. So um, the the tags that um, send the locations, those tags are about $2,000. Um, and those last about, you know, I'll say three to four years. Um, but they also have quite a bit of risk of um, malfunctioning. Um, the archival tags are four thousand dollars each so those are quite a bit more expensive um we've kind of moved more towards focusing on the on the location data um there are the the spot tags the ones that go on the dorsal fin that do collect depth and temperature data they are a bit more expensive like more around uh twenty eight hundred dollars instead of two thousand but they're a little bit bigger um and so those tags, we'd have to catch a, a big shark like that. Probably that eight foot female, I'd feel comfortable putting a bigger tag on her, but I probably wouldn't want to put a bigger tag on on some of the, you know, five to six foot sharks that, that we typically catch. Um, but it's all similar, you know, it's all opportunistic. I don't have um, dedicated funds to do this research. It's more, um, you know, if, if my collaborators have a little bit of slush money, we usually use it to buy a tag or two. Um, but it it's not um not something with uh, um, permanent funding, I guess. Permanent consistent funding. Is it partially due to uh, it not being a um, a species that's uh, harvested, I guess, or is there? It's really interesting. I, I catch them in my net occasionally, um, but uh, it's nice that you're doing the research on it. But I suppose yeah. the funding is just is due to the commercial availability. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, right now I think a lot of the focus, you know, and, and it always has been on on commercially important species, but especially now, even when there's proposals that say, you know, we need more research on on sharks because they are being incidentally caught in bycatch, but right now and we have salmon halibut and crab fisheries that are you know in record lows that funding is typically going to try to figure out what's going on in those fisheries and since sharks aren't commercially valuable um they don't they don't tend to attract as much of that that funding interest so um that's why it's been so opportunistic both in terms of using the existing salmon platforms for tagging but also um to get the, the funding for the tags So Sabrina, there's no more tagging in a Prince Wave Sound, is that correct? There, you know, there have Go ahead. Sorry about that. So there's no more tagging in Prince Wave Sound? There have been a few, there's been a few researchers from Oregon that have come up and tried to put um, cameras on, the, on dorsal fins of salmon sharks to see if they could you know, kind of get a shark's eye view of the world. Um, I don't think it's been more than one or two sharks in the last few years. So nothing, no dedicated efforts like the the Stanford tagging program that I that I showed the data on. Yeah, you know, Stanford did put out some acoustic tags, and uh, we had an underwater array there in Port Corvina. Now, of course, there's the ocean tracking network across uh, the entrances to the sound. And we were picking up one of those salmon sharks. It was that tag was eight or nine years old. So I mean, that's if somebody's doing work in the sound, I'd really encourage them. First of all, those tags are so much cheaper; they're under a thousand dollars. I think it'd probably be about five or six hundred dollars to put a tag on. And at least you get that entrance in and out of the sound. You get that timing. Yeah, and that's an, and to get you know an eight to you know nine year data set that's unheard of in in the satellite 
tracking world. So that's super exciting. At least you get, yeah, you can see dates of entry, dates of um, leaving the sound. But I don't, yeah, I don't know of anyone who's who's thinking about tagging back in in Prince William Sound. But um, who is that? Is that are those tag data? Is that through the Science Center? Well, the Science Center maintains the underwater array, the ocean tracking network, and um, we send the data up to Canada. But typically, if we see a tag, we try to track it down uh, and, and let the researcher know. And otherwise, they have to wait until that data is archived and available. But um, but no, it's I mean the array should keep going and, and for a while at least for we'll, we'll yeah, it'd just be so interesting to see, you know, annually if they, you know, are the dates pretty similar for that shark coming into and leaving the sound? Does it come every well, I, year? I can't remember now. I just remember it was primarily in and out of Hinchinbrook entrance more than Montague Strait, if my memory serves me correct. But, yeah. Uh, Sabrina, are there any uh, sport? fishing operations targeting these species? Yeah, there are, you, you know, there's quite a few in South in Southeast Alaska. And, you know, actually this summer, um, quite a few salmon sharks were taken out of um, a sport fishing lodge outside, outside of Juneau. And um, I, what, I was starting to get these observations and I was like, well, it should be recorded in the fish and game creel survey since it's sport fishing. Um, and I came to find out that they're no longer collecting species specific information on salmon sharks. So, um, you know, that's one of the hard things is that when you have species that again, aren't considered valuable, you know, commercially valuable, um, you know, resources are, you know, they're always stretched thin, but, um, just to know like, oh, we're, we're no longer collecting catch data on salmon sharks um, to me was pretty alarming. So of course I emailed the, the fish and game biologist and asked, you know, if we could start collecting that information again. But yeah, they took quite a few sharks out this year. And I don't know if that was because they were around um, and they just took advantage of, of them being um, close and abundant, or if it was, you know, maybe they weren't able to catch some of their other target species and and salmon sharks made a good a good substitution that part i'm not really too sure of any other questions all right well thank you so much yeah, thank you. Thank you. thanks everyone Thank you all for coming out and a reminder that if you have not signed in if you could please sign in We'd love to keep a count of how many people are attending. And next week? And next week's is going to be on Wednesday, not Tuesday. It's Colin Bronson, and he will be talking about the uh, Harbor Reconstruction Project. And that'll be here? And that'll be here. Yep. He'll, he'll be joining us here on Wednesday. And thank you, and drive safe. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. This conference will now be recorded.